Well, it's not secret that Uf Anderson is one of my favorite chess players ever. When I started playing chess, I was just so bad at playing end games that just to think about it right now is embarrassing. And yes, make no mistake, I am not yet Magnus Carson or anything close to that, but my end game technique has improved a lot, a lot since since that time to the to the point where I feel confident about playing end games right now, even against the strong players. And one of the reasons was the work that I did analyzing and studying Anderson games. He is one of the best technical players ever, and there are so many things that we can learn from him. And today we are going to analyze one of his games. I'm going to actually analyze many of his games uh, from the book that uh, Kaufel Jurgen wrote about Anderson, Grandmaster Chess Strategy. So, I hope you enjoyed this game. I hope it helps you to to improve your technique technique as it did with me. And let's go. So, Anderson was really fan of this line. He really liked to play uh, symmetrical lines. And he has several games where he literally gets the most of of this variation where things to be quite honest are pretty equal uh, things are pretty equal but uh, it's not like it's that draw so he is really good at that and there is that is something that we have to, to remember about the end game in the end game the right mindset is not about hey I have to push here and I have to win this position and I I mean I hope you have that mindset and uh, Bad in you that, that I hope that mindset is part of you, uh, but it doesn't have to take over or to process during the game. In the game, the right way to go about positions like the ones that we are going to see today is to try to to have a position where we can can create problems to the other guy, even as small problems, but like you know to keep pressure, to create problems, to make things difficult for the other guy. If you're thinking about hey, I have to win here. Or this is a position where I should push to, to definitely get the victory. It's not that we should never think about those things, but that actually is not helpful when we are trying to win. We are focused on looking for those little problems and creating those difficulties to the other guy, move after move, then our chances of getting that and result of getting the point are are more probable for to happen to us. So or was I? Nice c3. And here, black play d5. That is not the best move, but I don't think it's as bad as as Kaufeld considering in the book. So wait. It wasn't that move. It was knight take. Knight takes. Knight takes. Knight takes, knight takes, bishop g7, king g7, pawn takes, queen takes, and now pawn d4. This happened in several English lines where we can play this uh, pawn d4, queen the queen on d5, and the threat is knight d5. Uh, there is a line, well I'm not going to show it here not to make too long this video, but there is a line in particular that I'm thinking right now. But here, wow. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Another student trying to work on on the Venko. So here, black is more or less forced to take if he doesn't want to be in trouble. So pawn takes, knight takes. No, sorry, pawn takes, queen takes. Queen takes, knight takes, bishop takes, and rook takes. And this position, king takes, and this position is equalish. White is a slightly, slightly better. Slightly, slightly better. Why? Well, his knight is on the center already. And, and that's it, more or less. But uh, black make things worse here with his next move. So what should we play here? Well, probably rook d8 is the move to go. 
something like rook d8, pawn e6, rook d6, or even knight a6, rook d7, or even knight a6. The position should be close to equal. But black make here a mistake and play pawn a6. And that is a move that I really dislike. Why so? Well, because you don't want to make pawn movements on the end game just to react to something. Every time we move a pawn, especially if we are on the defensive side, we are weakening something in our position. When you have the initiative and the advantage, you can move the pounds, and especially as we are going to see in this game, if they help to restrain their guy. But when you are the guy that is protecting, that is defending, that is trying to protect something, to to do it with a pound movement usually is the last thing you want to do because your position will get get weakened. Now the basic pound is weak. The a6 pound is weaker than before. And you can argue, wait, but wait, <laughs> sorry, I also speak también hablo español, I also speak Spanish, uh, and I make videos in both languages. So. The thing with this movement is that now, even if it doesn't seem to be the case that you can use this weak spot, it's an extra problem that you did not have need to create. And we're going to see in the game how this is going to cost black. And it's not that he's going to lose because he played a6, but it's not the only move that he made that make things worse. So white play rook ac1. And now for black to develop is hard, and the threat for white is rook c7. So black is more or less forced to play now rook a7. And here, starting here, I will ask you to consider some moves, because I think it can be really useful for you to develop your intuition in the endgame, and your understanding. So please take here a few seconds and try to find the move that white should play to keep improving his position, okay? So, uh, take a couple of minutes, and in a little bit I will ask you to 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 compare that with what I with what Anderson played. Okay, I hope you you stop the video and you took some minutes, and if not, you can of course keep looking at the game. But I hope you found the best idea that is Rook C2, two double rocks on the C line. That's a really good move, one that will help us to improve our position. Black play rook d8. We don't want to move our knight, and e3 here is the end move to play. And now black make a mistake. And once again, please pay attention to this. I see this happening game after game when you are not that good in your end game technique. Uh, black here could play, for example, rook d6 and king f6 after that and keep everything under control the knight will come to d7 and um, white should be slightly better but the position is still perfectly uh, perfectly sound almost perfectly sound and for sure he, he should be able to sh to to hold but in the game <laughs> black will not help himself and play pawn e5 and yes pawn e5 looks like a really good move i mean what not to like about it? I am getting a space. I am attacking the knight. Uh, now my king can come to the center and come to the, the square e6, right? Because the knight is not in the center anymore. But once again, you don't want to keep pushing bounce and opening squares when you're defending. And now white has a target on the pawn in, on the e5 pawn. And after knight f3, well, black never wants to play pawn e4 because the knight will go to e4 and it will be set there. But after pawn e6, that looks like the con like the logical move. White has a way to improve his advantage one more time. You're taking, using, getting the most of this mistake, okay, of this bad plan. So please take a couple of minutes here trying to find white's move and compare what you thought with what is gonna 
be played by Anderson. Okay, let's go. Couple minutes. Okay, hope you're back. And if you found the move played by White, well, awesome. Because G4 <laughs> played by Anderson is a great, great move. Now, what is the idea of this move? Well, it has several ideas. First, it's a, a move that takes a space and makes hard for Black to play, uh, to move his pounds. Okay? And it's not like Black should want to do it, as I mentioned before, but if he ever does it, I can take, like, if e5, f5 eventually, or h5, h5, right now is possible. Well, I will take, take, and then the h pound will be weaker. Okay. Also, g5 could be a potential threat. g5 to take on f6, and now the e pawn will be a, a definitely a target. And if Black tries to stop that playing g5, well, my knight could go to f5, giving a one turn. But like knight d2, knight e4, knight g3, and knight f5 will be possible. <laughs> so black definitely don't want to play g5 himself and this move just puts pressure then in the black position now after g4 black play rook d6 white play rook fc1 good move reinforcing the control of the c line and trying to come with the rook eventually to to c8, c7 or as it happened in the game after knight d7 to c6. A move that also is really instructive of how to play the endgame. There is one rule, one piece of one piece of advice in the endgame. There are many about how to trade pieces, mm -hmm. right? But the one that you will hear often and you will see often when you see the game of masters in the endgame is that they try to trade usually a pair of rooks. If there are four rooks, they try to keep one for each side. Why so? Because with four rooks on the board, it's really easy for the guy defending to create counterplay. Or it's not really easy, it's easier. There are more chances of that. But once you trade one rook, the chances of the other guy creating counterplay are harder. And the rook is really good at attacking multiple targets. Like for example, my rook on c6, once black takes, let's see this. Now puts pressure on b6 and on f6. And also, why rook c6 and not rook c7? Because maybe you hear the rule, oh, you should take the seven line. Well, because if I put the rook on c6, actually I'm taking out the strongest black piece. I mean, look at this rook, it's terrible. With the pawn on a6, restricting his movements, protecting the knight, but not really much. Uh, of not really much in terms of what could happen in the future for that rook and instead compare that rook with the rook on d6 in open line where he could eventually possibly come to d2 and attack uh, the back the white rear so rook c6 is uh, just a wonderful move here and as I mentioned once I take and he, he takes and I take I put permanent pressure on on b6 and f6 and look black wish the pawn was in a7 yeah the rook will have to be somewhere different but now he has to put permanent attention to the b6 pawn black play king f7 and here once again an important moment to think about what to do here please stop your clock, stop the video, take a couple minutes, two to five minutes, and try to find how White improved his position here. Okay? You already hope, well, on this game right, uh, right now, White is better, but it's hard, so it's hard to find how to how to improve things, right? And here in this kind of positions, even before, there is a tool 
that is important for you to learn. And that tool, one that is really common in Anderson games, is the schematic thinking. And let me explain that a little more in deep. In this position, at this position, I think it's great for that. Well, a schematic thinking is basically a skill that we use on the end games where there is no much counterplay, much tactics happening. Here is clear that Black is not going to probably play something like uh, Rook C7 sacrificing the Rook or something like Knight C5 sacrificing the B pound. Okay? Black has no real counterplay and no way to create tactical ideas. So when this happens, in the end game it's really important to think in terms of setups because black has no counterplay. Why should we focus on trying to get the most out of his pieces? Try try to look for a setup where he can see that his position is better than it is right now in terms of the way that he is structured things, like the pieces, where they are, where should be the pound. So you should try to think on that way. Where should I put my pieces? Where should I put my pounds? How should I progress in the next moves, assuming that he is not going to be able to change the nature of the game? And of course, we are going to look for that. We're going to look to not allow the other guy to change the nature of the game. And here, Anderson, thinking in those terms, found a terrific idea. I'm going to play my knight to d2 and then to e4. And he's going to be better, obviously, that he is right now on f3, putting pressure on all black's position. Also, uh, probably he found out here that he could or should play something like pawn before taking the c5 square from the knight and fixing the black pounds <coughs> in the queen side. And and maybe even more, and I'm going to talk about that in the next moves because I don't want to spoil everything that that happened. But yeah, knight d2. And look, now black will try to play something like pawn f5. But then I could just take. I could just take and play rook d6. And black is more or less paralyzed. Even knight c4 could be strong here, but the point is that the king cannot, should not go to, to e7 because rook a6. And I am playing knight c4 or knight f3. And if I put my knight, knight on c4 or f3, it's going to be really hard for black to hold everything. But look at how convenient it was to play d4 before. Because now these pounds are more, are way softer than they would be if the pawn was on g6, uh, if the pawns were on g6 and g3. So in the game, black tried to keep everything together. King e7, knight e4, rook b7. And now with the rook on b7 and the knight on e4, white play pawn b4. Another powerful move that takes a squares. And when you have advantage on these positions, you want to, to fix the weak spots. So for example, pawn a4 and pawn b5 could potentially be a great idea. There are things that you want to do is to create weak spots. And here black help a lot. I mean, white didn't have to do that much in that regard because black weakened his own pounds, right? The a6 pound, the b6 pound. So white didn't have to work on that. But usually when the other guy doesn't help us that much, we try to create the weak spots either with pressure of the pieces, but in the end game that is not that easy. Sometimes it's hard because of the lack of pieces. And there are ways pushing our pounds. So for example, h4 and h5, or h4 and g5, could be potential ideas here for white to try to create those extra weak spots. When one, when the side defending has to protect only one weak thing, it's really hard uh, to win. 
Okay, but when we make him to have to protect several weak spots, because our advantage or mobility is going to be better. So it's going to be easier for us to attack than for him def to defend. And when you have multiple weak spots and you have to defend multiple weak spots against a guy with more mobility, well, something is going to drop. Well, pump four, rook b8. And now the magic of Anderson. Once again, he improves the position. This time, I see three. Look at how the knight went from all the way from f3 to coming soon d5. And here black realized that the position is more or less collapsing. Let's say that you play something like king f7, then we come with knight d5. And if rook b7, rook b6. And black is more or less out of movements. If he moves the rook to a7, the pawn b6 falls. If he moves the king to g7, well, rook e6 to rook e7 just wins the game. <coughs> you have no defense. For example, wow, for example, what? What can you play here? Like a6, check. King f8, rook h7. And the threat is to take the a6 pound and to take the f6 pound. And of course, if king g8, rook takes d7. I may get the whole piece. So. This is a disaster of position for black. Black here didn't find anything better than. Playing f5 to stop avoid that sub zone from happening. Sorry. But. Wait, no, no, no. I'd say something wrong. My c3, yeah. And I mentioned king f7, but here black actually play pawn f5. Now knight d5, king f7, and king g3. White could take on f5 immediately, doesn't change much, uh, things much. Black decided to play h5, that actually is another pound movement that it just makes everything go downhill faster. Pound takes, pound takes, rook d6, rook b7, king h4, and just like that, black with equal material resign but there is no way to hold everything he is going to lose the h5 pound and after that white will go for the five pound um black is still more or less in sub one he cannot move his pieces really so what things can we learn from this game that could help us in our end game technique well what things should we pay, pay attention when we analyze Anderson games? Uh, number one, the way that he makes the most of his pieces. He's just great at that. In this case, rook c2 and rook c1 is a strong maneuver, but also to make the most of our pieces, we have to use the tool that I mentioned before, the schematic thinking. If we think in terms of setups and where to put our pieces in positions where there are no really tactical ideas that could change the position we have to do it the other thing is that talking about the defensive side we should not move our pounds if there is no thing if there is we are not really getting a lot from it because then we are only weakening our position like black at the end of the game wish his pawns were still in their original squares but that didn't happen and this move that reminds me something that maybe I was not clear about uh, in the game. I mentioned it, but d4 also looks to create a second weak spot, the thing that I mentioned before, but d4 goes in that line. We cannot win here if we, not, we don't create weak 
spots on the black position. And this move is moving towards that direction. Really important always in banking. If you're just trying to win because the other guy has an isolated town, so I would try to win the isolated town and win the game, probably you're going to get the pound. But still, if there is nothing else, many end games will end on draw. But if he has other weak spots and he's forced to protect the pawn, then his position will deteriorate. We will probably get the pawn and, and more. So the two weakness principle, the schematic thinking, oh, and nice a typical idea, trade a pair of rooks. The schematic, one second. Max. ¿Qué pasó? No, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, he's great, but he hates cats. <laughs> okay, and a schematic thinking, I mentioned it already. Okay, wait a second. 92. Not pawn five. Yeah. And once again, schematic thinking. Look at how he improved his pieces. The knight went all the way. Well, the rook is on c6, putting pressure on black position. The knight went all the way from f3 to c3. And even the king is part of the final assault. Note this line. Five us. Yeah. No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Maybe five. And even the king is part of the final assault. Just compare the white pieces with the black pieces. I think I think no, I know uh Jaco Kapgar, one of the best trainers in the world, always say that the the real chess players uh, he mentioned this, the richest players are the ones that know where to put his pieces and have this skill to make their guy pieces to be worse and their pieces be better in the best situation, in the best positions. And that is something that when we study games of players like Henderson or Carson, Karpov, Kramnik, all these great technical players, uh, we should really pay attention to. How do they get the most out of their pieces? And for now, I guess that's all. I hope this game was uh, helpful, and I hope this is one. Of, this game helps you to get one step closer to having a really good end game technique. Okay, so that's all for now. Take care, and I'll see you next time with and our hopefully really instructive game from Anderson. Take care.